Miss Fletcher. Welcome, Sister Fletcher. Sister Tisha and Elder Cheryl Rambo per year. Welcome. Greetings to you too. Sister Linda. Hello, Pastor Kay. How y'all doing? Good evening. Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome, Lake Queen Christian Center. Uh, welcome to our midweek service. My name is Pastor Derek T. Griffin. It is an awesome pleasure to be here this evening to uh, once again bring a word from God, a word from our Bible, a word from heaven uh, that will definitely be a blessing. We always know whenever we are in the scriptures, we're in the right place. We're in the truth. We're in Jesus. We're in Christ. We're in faith. And that's where the power is, that's where the anointing is, that's where all of our deliverance, redemption, anything that you can name that puts us even closer to our final destination in the will of God is what you'll find in the word of God. Amen. And I also like to thank Pastor Riley and Pastor Kay. Thank you both for allowing me, allowing me to bring this word to our family, to our ministry, and to those who are abroad, those out of state, those out of the country who join us every week on Sundays and Wednesdays. God bless you all. And thank you for your, your sincere commitment and participation. And there's Miss Keisha, how you doing? And Mother Betty, how y'all doing? But we really appreciate everyone and your participation. We're going to continue tonight's message from last week. This is part two. I'm going to go ahead and open with prayer and let us get started. And as always, 
I simply ask that those of you who are uh, trying to obtain your ministerial certificate uh, to be, uh, of course, ordained by our pastors uh, to be a part of this ministry in a more, uh, more, more teaching way, in a more active way. More active is what's important to be in Christ, to be active in Christ, right? Faith without works is dead. So let's get busy. But take notes, take notes, just not the scriptures, but you might get something that God reveals to you that you need to write down so you can get back to it and kind of allow it to flow in your spirit because God wants to reveal something to each and every one of us. And I'm sure that there's a nugget for everyone. There'll be a nugget specifically for others and there'll be some real revelation for those of you who are really seeking God especially during this fast that Pastor Riley has called for the rest of this month. Uh, it has been a wonderful, wonderful fast for myself and my family, my wife. Uh, we have been doing wonderfully and we're very surprised on how we feel better. We just feel good, right? God also wants us to be physically uh, well during this fast, but also more importantly, spiritually. And so tonight we're going to really have a blessing. So I'm going to go ahead and open up with prayer and let's get started. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us together this evening. As always, I ask that you think through my mind and speak through my vocal cord as I minister to these, your sheep. Lord, I pray that there's none of me in all of you. Okay, it's very important that you we die to self. Amen. So I'm dead to Derek, but I'm alive to Jesus. I'm alive to Christ, Father. And, and I just ask that, you know, when this revelation knowledge, when it flows freely, uninterrupted by any demonic or satanic force, that your word will have more power, more impact. And that results will come forth, God. There'll be manifestation of goodness and greatness in the lives of your children here in this earth as we contend with the spiritual battle that we're up against because the enemy is at work. We know he is busy doing what he does. It's very prevalent right now in the earth, but we know we have the victory. The battle has already been won. Amen. And so, God, we just say thank you. We thank you for these opportunities to share your word. And we give you all the honor, all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, part two of historical faith, 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 versus saving faith. Um, I, I, you know, this message came to me clearly uh, some weeks ago, and I said, I got to get back to it. I got to get back to it because there have been times in my walk uh, after receiving Christ that I had some challenges in determining, am I really saved? You know, I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you go through a process after you accept Jesus Christ. You're a babe in Christ when you do it. Years ago when I was 21 years old is when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And since then, I've been on this spiritual journey. And during that journey, you know, there are attacks. Um, and then then we're also uh, motivated. Hey, Danae, how you doing? How you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. God bless you. But as I was saying, it's it's like, you know, it's been a journey. Uh, and the journey had some storms. Uh, it had some challenges. I've been tested. I've even fallen. I've made mistakes. I've tripped up. I mean, I've gone through a lot. And, and, and during that time, I'm, I'm also in the process of trying to mature in the things of Christ, in the word of God. There's a maturation process that must take place in all of us from the babe in Christ when we first receive him to where now those of us that are 10 years in, 12 years in, 15, 20 years in, there ought to be a change. There ought to be in your mind. You should know I'm locked in and I'm good to go. And so I wanted to make sure because we're in the final days, we're in the end of days. We know of this. We recognize the signs that the Bible has clearly stated to recognize, to know where we are, what season we're in. And so it's all the more important that we as a ministry, we as ministers of the gospel, know that we should be winning souls. We really need to be checking ourselves in terms of salvation. Are we really locked in and are we in the will of God? But it's important that we know that we are so that we can help others come to where we are. So if you're not clear in terms of where you stand in Christ, how in the world can you win others to that, right? And so we have to be clear. We have to know without beyond a shadow of a doubt, okay, that we are operating in saving faith, true biblical faith, and not the world's version of that. And so we're going to continue tonight's message on part two, because this is important, not just for the pastors, but for the elders, and not just for the elders, but for the ministers, and not just the ministers, the evangelists, not just the evangelists, but also the members of our ministry who are born again. This is for you. This is a message for you because we need to know that we know that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we 
are saved. Amen. All right. So let's move forward. I'm going to talk about, let's start with the foundational scripture in part one, because I want to give you a different translation of that, because that scripture, it says a lot. And this was Paul when he was talking to the Galatians, church of Galatia with the Galatians, uh, two and 20, Galatians two and 20. I'm going to read the English standard version first. And then I'm going to give you the translation, the God's world translation. Uh, of that same scripture so we can break it down as we go into dive into this saving faith here's where paul is now let's recognize who paul is real quick so you'll understand why he's making this statement to the church of galatia to the people of galatia he came from a place where his name was different his name was saul you gotta remember his name was changed after his conversion one of the things i want you all to understand there is a conversion that takes place in a born-again christian's life you convert from a sinful man to a saved, born again man, a new man, a new creature. There's a conversion as if you go from a caterpillar to a butterfly. There is a difference between the look and the feel and the walk and the life of a caterpillar as it is to a butterfly. But they were the same creature. They started out as a caterpillar and then there was a season where he went into a cocoon and the metamorphosis took place where he changed, he was transformed from a lowly caterpillar who was always stuck to the ground and vulnerable to the, to the, to the birds and to the, to the other uh, animals and things that would eat on them. And they were very defenseless as a caterpillar. If you ever know caterpillars, they're defenseless. Most of them don't have any mechanism for defense against anyone attacking them. I used to play with them and they crawled and everything, but man, they get stepped on, crushed the whole nine. But those who made it, from that caterpillar form, our sinful nature is the caterpillar. We're really weak in sin, not strong in sin, we're weak in sin. Then they go through a metamorphosis, a conversion, a transformation, physically, but watch this, to a butterfly. But man, I'm sure that butterfly felt a whole lot better, had a whole nother life, a whole nother vision, a whole nother plan to fly. They went from being uh, submitted and forbidden to the ground as a caterpillar to holding on and then accepting the change in their life to now fly as a butterfly, never to go back to, watch this, never to go back to the state or the condition of a caterpillar. So when you're born again, you need to be transformed. There needs to be a change in who you are. And Paul had that change. Paul knew where he came from as Saul. And it's very, it's very important to know now that he's Paul, he's letting them know, check this out. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Wow. And gave himself for me. So he had a change of heart, a change of mind. When he was Saul, he hated Christians. He hated those of the faith who believed in the faith of God. He hate, he killed them. He had them murdered children, mothers, men. People feared him as Saul. He then had his experience with God, converted. God renamed him. New man, new creature, Paul. But he now identifies with Christ as his. Christ loves him. He, he accepted, received that love. He didn't operate in condemnation from his past. His past doing, there was one point in the Bible where he says, I've done no man wrong. Y'all remember when Paul said that? He was like, wait a minute, dude. You was the cat that was killing jokers back in the day, right? He like, I ain't done nobody wrong. Why? Because he accepted the conversion. He literally said, I'm a new man. And now that I've taken hold of Christ, who died for the sins that I committed as Saul, I no longer have to identify with that caterpillar anymore. I'm now the butterfly and I'm good with that. Oh, good God. So I want you all to really see this. And this is how you know, based on what I'm sharing with you, I'm truly in saving faith. I'm not in a, in a, in a type of faith that some people are dealing with and they're not necessarily, watch this, converted. Because a converted Christian, a converted creature of God that started out as a sinful man who's been converted to a new man born again in Christ Jesus, guess what? There's a lot that comes along with that to confirm that you are his. And that's when you know, I got this thing. I am saved. Now do something with it that makes God proud. Amen. All right. So here's the translation of Galatians 2.20, God's 
translation, God's word translation of that same scripture. Watch this. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by believing in God's son who loved me and took the punishment for my sins. That's huge. Brothers and sisters, believers, children of God, that right there, understand what Jesus did for you to operate in salvation, to know that you are born again, child of God, that born again status was bought by the blood of Jesus. That born again status, that now in salvation redeemed from the pit of hell, redeemed from the penalty of the sin that you were in as a caterpillar, Jesus said, I paid that price for you. You don't have to pay it anymore. So see, this is why it's significant that we as believers get folks really tied up and tied into, you gotta be born again, because if you don't get born again, you're fighting against the bricks in your own power and you don't have God to help you. And so you're gonna suffer from that penalty that's due to you in your sinful state as a caterpillar, you're going to suffer the punishment. The only way you're going to avoid it is not you trying to be a good person and still classified as a caterpillar, as a sinner. If you're still operating under the sin curse because it was put on you by Adam and you can't take it away, you can't, listen, you can't just take it away. You can't just dismiss it in your mind. You can't talk it away, and nor can you do a bunch of good works in sin to say, I've done a good job, Lord. I was good to people. I gave people money. I saved this person. I did all this. I was nice and kind to people. That's not what we're talking about here. You've got to accept the one who died and, and did all things under the sun. Watch, watch this. When I say all things under the sun, I'm talking about he did, he took on what we did under the sun in sin. He took it on. He was a perfect man. He, and there was no sin in him, but he suffered the punishment of a sinner. You understand what I'm saying? The sinner. He suffered the punishment and the ridicule and the damnation of a sinful man. He took it upon himself, although he was innocent. And he did it for us. That's the love Paul is talking about. That's love. For somebody to die for you when you were guilty, you know you did it, but they took the penalty, and they went and died on behalf of you. They took the death penalty and said, kill me, let them live, although they're wrong and I'm not. That's love. And that you have to accept. You have to believe that was done on your behalf. And then God sees that sincerely coming from you in your heart. And now he's got something to work with to help you in your journey as a new creature in Christ. So it doesn't instantaneously make you a perfect man, but it puts you under the covering of that perfect man named Jesus Christ. So now God doesn't see you as sinful man anymore. He sees you as that butterfly in Jesus. Amen. God bless you. So we move on. And now we're going to start with part two. Amen. And I want to go to the uh, scripture. Go to 1 John 2 and 15. And this is how we're going to start off tonight. And I just wanted to set that as the preface. This is what you need to understand when we talk about saving faith. It's got to be believing what God and what Christ did. God's son, Jesus Christ, what he did for us was done and it was legit. It was real. It was done. It was, it was a fact. It's not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. That there was a man that God put in the earth uh, in our likeness and took on every penalty and sin that we committed for every man in the past, present, and future. He died for them, but in order to receive, watch this, the pardon that Christ established, you have to receive him. And then he takes your place. Amen. And so God now can work with us again. Our restoration of relationship with God is restored through Christ and Christ only, y'all, nobody else. And you can't get to God without him. You can't go around Jesus and say, God, I was better than Jesus. No, you're not. You were born a sinner. You, you were born that way. You were born with what? A malfunction, a malady, an issue, a virus. You were born with it. And the only way to get the antidote is to receive the blood of Jesus. <laughs> There's no other antidote but Jesus for the sin. 
Oh my gosh, y'all see me. You're going to, let's go to 1 John 2 and 15. I'm going to read the New King James Version. This is the foundation scripture for this evening. It says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow. Check that out. I'm going to read another translation. 1 John 2 and 15, the New Living Translation says this, says it this way. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. <laughs> For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, if there's no love of the Father in you, you're not saved, ladies and gentlemen. If you are still loving worldly things, being sinful and prideful and doing all that and getting down and having a great time and don't care nothing about what God's talking about, and you get excited about everything the world is offering you and all this Party hardy, play the lottery, sinful nature, do whatever, drink, smoke, whatever, get high, la, 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 la. all of that is fleshy, worldly stuff. And if you're not convicted of that, then I question the Father's love in you. I question that. Because if you are enjoying that and you're not convicted, then that means the Holy Spirit is not in you to convict you to say, okay, I need to get back in order again. Because don't get me wrong, even as believers, we make mistakes, don't we? We fall every now and then. Yeah, we probably get in a little darkness for a season. There are folks that go away from the church for a season because they're dismayed, they're confused, distracted. They get pulled back in. That's called backsliding. We understand that. But the Holy Spirit will minister to them during those times and say, get back, get back, come back, get back. And then we get back and we get right back on target. And now we have a testimony. Praise God. And now we're back in even stronger than when we was before. See, that's when you know you have a right relationship with God because you're not comfortable in sin. You're not comfortable being worldly. It's just a discomfort. Like, I don't belong here. I don't be, something's not right. I don't enjoy this like I used to. This is not, this is not me. Why? Because now you're a new creature. I, 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 I know I'm talking to someone. I know I am. Praise God. Please understand. I'm not being judgmental. I'm actually doing this. Go to 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. This is what we're doing. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. I'm going to show you this is scriptural. It says, the New King James Version, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Ha! There it is. I mean, even in scripture, Paul is saying he had to examine himself. He had to check himself out and say, am I really changed? Am I really saved? Because I got to know because I don't want to be wasting my time barking up the wrong tree. And at the end of the day, when judgment comes, God said, you missed it. You were not saved. But God is so loving. God is so caring. He would not leave us to be blinded to the fact that we are saved. He wants us to know. He wants us to experience his promises. He wants us to experience him in our lives. He wants that relationship. That's why he gave us Jesus, so that when we do truly take a genuine faith towards trusting God and loving God and trusting the, 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 the whole mission of having Christ come as the second Adam or the last Adam to redeem us from the curse of the first Adam so that we can experience the fullness and the greatness of his grace. Not just his mercy, but his grace and his love that's afforded to those who believe and are born again. And God shows his grace and mercy. When we get up in the morning, praise God, and you're wrapped in your right mind and there's no calamity, no issues, nobody breaking in your house, breaking in your car. You got angels on every corner looking out for you. Trust me, in this crazy world that we drive through every day, up and down the highways and byways and see all of these different calamities. But don't get me wrong, even when we get in those issues, Jesus is there to get us what? Through it. See, let's not get it twisted. When you get born again, that doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to have a perfect life. That you're not going to be challenged. You're not going to have a trial. You're not going to have a circumstance. You're not going to have an issue. You're not going to have a sickness. You're not going to have a failure. You're not going to have a heartbreak. You're going to have all of that because that's life. That is life. But the difference is when you have the right relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll even carry you in your mess. Good God, y'all hear me. I'll get you through that mess. Christ did not die in vain and then came back to life in vain. 
so that we wouldn't have that power available to us through life circumstances. That's the difference between an unbeliever and a believer. The unbeliever, the unborn again, the ones that are not in saving faith, when life hits them, oh, it's a mess. It's like a shotgun of mess. They, it just spreads and affects everybody around them in a very detrimental way. It's all done. Domino effect, right? Domino effect. You hear stories about folks who are under the QAnon uh, conspiracy theory concept. I was reading stories. I, I read, I saw an article to my, my cousin Jamie, and I said, baby, read this. It's amazing. There was a man who was a good guy, good man, according to the world thing. He was a good man, had a family, wife, and everything. Got caught up in QAnon. And then in those theories, following that logic, following that faith, he ended up killing his wife and trying to kill his daughter as well, based on what he was believing in and they didn't want to believe in it. So I'm, I'm just saying we got to be careful so that we understand that the believer has the Holy Spirit. And even though we have challenges, and yes, we do. And if you're not challenged, I question whether you stand in faith, because the Bible says there will be trials and tribulations to those of us who believe. We'll be persecuted. Yes, sir. People will talk about us, mock us, laugh at us. Folks laughing at me right now. It's all good. But the Holy Spirit is there to guide us and to minister to us, ministering angels that God sends, things that help us get through. Even if he sends it through a text message or he might have somebody call us to give us encouragement out of nowhere. I mean, God has a way to get to us, to keep us strong, to keep us solid. Y'all know what I'm talking about, those who are in saving faith. To save us from detriment when we're in our mess. Amen. Whoo! Now, so 1 John 2 and 15, right? You got that? Check this out. I read the New King James Version. Watch what this says. You got to talk about it. It says what the world offers you. So it's not just loving the world, but it's also when you hear worldly things coming your way to pull you away from your faith and your walk in Christ, you got to know that's what it is. Don't accept that. Don't allow the money behind the devil's offer to pull you away from your commitment to Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. See, either you're converted or you're not. Either you're the butterfly now or you're the caterpillar. You're either one or the other. You can't be both. See, that's straddling the fence. Either you're in or you're out. You got to have a transformation. It has to be a conversion before there's conviction. See, if you're not converted, you won't feel conviction from the spirit of God. You have no spirit of God in you to convict you when you're about to be tempted out of your faith. You'll know when you're saved, when you get convicted and you say, I hear you, Lord, and you keep it moving that way and don't yield to what? To temptation. Y'all don't hear me. Now, here we go. You have saving faith. Right. But there are other types of faith I want you all to hear about. There are other types of faith you need to hear about tonight. This is where we're going to get started, where I left off last. Saving faith is thus this. A firm conviction and trust in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. A firm conviction. Commitment. Convicted. In other words, I'm committed to this, to this, to the ministry of Christ. I'm committed to the, the faith, my faith in Christ. I'm locked in. I'm locked in. I'm not wavering in trusting this message and trusting that God did allow his son to die for me and that God so loved the world, which means me, worldly me. He loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for me. Amen. So that I could then what? Rise from the dead. And live eternal, in, in eternity with God. Hallelujah. So that, I'm convicted. I'm, I'm convicted of that. I trust that message. I do not waver in that message. I stand firm on that message. And I will die in that message. I don't care at this point about anything anyone else has to offer outside of that message. I am locked in. Period. That's what God is looking for in our hearts. A conviction where he says, I can work with that because now I'm abiding in my conviction and God says, I'll abide in you. If you lock into to this truth, this belief that Jesus Christ died for you and your sins forevermore and you're never going to hell. Now that you've done that, not necessarily caught up in the mistakes you made while you're born again. We make mistakes because we're fleshy people in a human situation, a human experience. But I've accepted my clemency from Christ. Therefore, I am now operating in the love of God 
and not the, the terror of God punishing me, but the love of God who's forgiven me and gives me grace to get back in order, to get my life right, to get where he wants me to be and operate in pleasing him by faith. Y'all don't hear me. This is a very important message. Extremely important message. All right. So saving faith is thus a firm conviction and trust in the person and work of Christ. I'm going to break that down. So you're, it's not your works that you're trusting in to get to God. It's the works of Christ, right? But the Bible does speak of other types of faith. Watch this. Theologians have discussed historical faith, which is a bare intellectual grasp of the claims of scripture, barren of the work of the spirit. So historical faith means, I, I believe the facts that are in the Bible and other supporting documentation and, 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 and text that support the, the life of Christ and, and God's purpose and God's plan and the promises. And that's cool. I get it. I get the facts. Intellectually, I'm sound and we can debate intellectually about who Jesus is, black, white, green, Hispanic, yellow. We can debate whether or not he's truly a prophet versus a savior or the Messiah. We can debate these facts. We can go over and over in that. But if you don't have a relationship with him, if you're not operating in believing what has been stated in the Bible, biblical faith, that he did die for you and you have to accept that in order to be accepted into the kingdom and to receive your, your, your past to eternity in heaven, if you can't believe that, then what's the point of knowing the facts? So you got a lot of folks that are very excited about the fact they have knowledge of Christ. They have knowledge of God. They have knowledge of the prophets. They have knowledge of the history of the Old and the New Testament and so forth and so on from Genesis to Revelation. But knowledge is not enough to get you free from the penalty of sin. It's just not enough. But you got folks feeling all good and gandy because they know scripture, 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 scripture. But they ain't got no connection. What's the point to be knowledgeable and scripture bound but no connection to the source that's going to deliver you from your penalty of sin. So anyway, the Apostle Paul, for example, tried to King Agrippa for his belief in the Old Testament prophets, but the king did not believe in Jesus. He didn't believe in the coming Messiah. He didn't want to believe in that, that particular prophecy that was all throughout the land in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was about prophesying the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ. They knew in the past in the Old Testament that through their, their, their faith and their belief system, we're talking about, you know, the Israelites, right? We're talking about those individuals who were the chosen people of God. They had a belief that one day there would be, and they thought it was going to be a king, right? That's why, God, give us a king, give us a Messiah. That there's only one, the one that they knew through the prophets was going to be the Messiah, not a Messiah, but the Messiah, the only one that would be who we would have to believe in for redemption of sin. Amen? So we have that. So that's what Paul is saying. It was back then, right? So let's go through that. Let's go to Acts 26, 27 through 28. Okay? And we're going to show you where this was apparent at that time. He talks about Old Testament. He says, King Agrippa... Do you believe in the prophets? Or do you believe the prophets? He's like, yeah, King Group like that. I, I know what the prophets say. He says, I know that you believe in that. I know you believe in facts, right? In verse 28, he says, and Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? In other words, you got very little time, brother, to say what you got to say. I ain't trying to believe in what you're talking about right now. Leave that alone. Have you not experienced that with people when you're trying to help people, you know, make a decision to be born again? I know I have. Yo, man, go on with all that Jesus stuff right now, dog. Leave that alone, man. I ain't, I ain't, you know, hey, 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 time out. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like the world has thrown out so many negative connotations of the church, the body of Christ, especially the black church. We have caught so much negativity through the mega churches and all these different things, the bad press and so forth. It's a lot, it's been shot and people have run from the church by, by what the world says about us. Amen. And so now that we go on and continue to do what God has called us to do, we're being chided. Just like Agrippa did Paul. Don't come here with that mess, Paul. Don't come in here with that Jesus stuff. All right? I'm good, man. I'm happy with what I'm doing. You know, I'm a good person, dude. You know, let's not be enemies in this thing. Just trust me. You do your thing. I do my thing. Have you ever had? That's what I'm talking about. And you got folks just like that. Amen? All right. So, uh, here's again. The scriptures also speak of temporary faith. Temporary faith, everybody. 
Temporary faith, which is when a person temporarily believes in the gospel, but later falls away. Christ's parable of the sword captures this type of faith. Uh, if you go to Matthew 13 and 5 and 6, it breaks that down. I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase all of that for you. Very simply, it talks about in a parable type of way, the ground that the Christ is speaking of is our hearts. And quite frankly, you have folks that come to church, they hear the word, they get excited. They're on fire. But what happens is because it doesn't take root, it doesn't last very long. And they're right back out there in the world again. So, you know, you've got to have a fertile ground to receive this message of the gospel. There has to be a hunger and a desire for change in your life. And that hunger, God says, seeking you shall find, right? Knocking it shall be open. I mean, it's real, it's real godly to say, hey, I know I'm wrong. I know I'm a sinner and I don't want to die this way. I don't want to live this way. Father, please, God, please save me from this. And then that sincere request. You hear it, you receive it, and now it takes root. And when you take root, when it takes root, rooted and grounded in that belief that I'm now born again, thank you, Jesus, the love of God is showered on your heart. You feel the love. I mean, you really will sense the love of God when you make that decision. God makes himself prevalent and present in your life in that moment when you've made a quality decision, I'm now going to receive Jesus Christ my Savior. It's boom. He's like, I'm there. And then all of a sudden, guess what happens? He says, you're going to start producing more goodness. Why? Because the Holy Spirit that God sent in that transition, in that experience, is now going to give you that ability to be fruitful and to now move in towards becoming in the image of Christ, becoming Christ-like. That's the mission we're on now. All of us, born again, we have to become Christ-like to continue to do the work of Christ, the mission, the purpose, in the will of God. Amen. Moving on. The third, third type of faith is this. The third type of faith is the faith of demons. How about that? Did you know that demons have faith? Yeah, watch this. This category is similar to historical faith. And James writes about this. Go to James 2 and 19. It says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So here's the deal. In other words, demons know the facts that God exists and is sovereign over all, including their own demonic realm. Do you hear me? Demons know that not only is God sovereign over all, as we see it in our realm as the church and the body of Christ, he's sovereign over us. He's also sovereign over hell. Hello. He has the authority over hell. The demons know this. They know that he is the God that has power and authority over everybody, including them. So, yes, they believe that God is. Yes, they believe that Jesus is. But here's the thing. Here's the difference. And I, I know some people that has demonic faith. OK, seriously, it's amazing. But you'll know I'm telling the truth. But let's move on. It says demons comprehend these facts and the comprehension of this knowledge creates faith fear in them. Now, not the fear that God asked us to have of our father. God asked us, to, the Bible asked us to fear God too. But the fear that demons have of God are terror. They're terrified because they know that he's getting ready to do what? Punish them. They have a punishment that they're due. See, the fear that we should have is more of a reverent fear, right? A respect, a high regard, a love of that God because of what he's done for me. And I fear him because it just makes sense in terms of what? He is God. He's my father. And he's got these greater of all. And I respect that and I honor that. And that's what compels me to praise his name, to get into his word, to do the things in faith that he has asked me to do, to be obedient because obedience to the word of God is a direct reflection of your commitment to God. Come on now. It doesn't necessarily guarantee you salvation. That's guaranteed when you receive Jesus Christ. But your obedience to the commandments shows your love for him. Your commitment, right? It's no different than my commitment to my wife. It's in my obedience to remain faithful and true. You have to have action in a relationship to prove your validness. You're, are you valid in terms of this marriage or are you not? We're married to Christ. How do you know? Well, it's based on your love and obedience to him 
as the as the as the as the, as the groom. We're the bride. The church is the bride. He's the groom. Are we committed in that relationship? Or are we out here floundering, chasing other gods and chasing money and chasing all these other idols? Now we're cheating on Jesus because we're not obedient unto what? The contract, the covenant, bro. So we really got to recognize, are you really saved? Because if you don't have any conviction relative to that relationship with Jesus, then you can't be committed to nothing but yourself. And that means you haven't died to self because if you're moving based on what you want, and how you want to do things, and how you want to make sure you're good, and you do it your way, and you're not doing it his way, then guess what? You're out of order, and I kind of, I have a sense you're not in saving faith, you're in a demonic type of faith. And we need to know the difference so that we don't get caught up and get deceived by the world because we haven't committed and convicted ourselves to the truth of the word of God. And then live by it. Not just say historically facts. I know the facts. Oh, I know Jesus. I know that, that, that. But I'm living it. And it's apparent in how I move in good times. Watch this. And how I move in bad times. Amen. So, saving faith is what we're about. And the adjective saving denotes that this type of faith is a sovereign work of God's spirit that secures a sinner's salvation. So once you understand that the spirit of God, when you get born again, actually will come inside and it will create this element that helps you to espouse or revelatory understanding. You'll have a, an epiphany to know that, oh my God, I'm saved from sin, man. And you get secure in it and you lock in. And you're like, oh, I'm staying right over here. I'm not, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not straying from this anymore. Oh, no, no, no. But how does saving faith work in the broader scope of the doctrine of salvation? Here's how it works. And this is how we'll close. All right. We must recognize with scripture that faith works through, watch this, everybody, love. And so I kind of want you to understand this love thing because here's where we have issues in the family, in the black family, in our communities. That's why there's so much of us killing each other. Uh, uh, stabbing each other in the back, doing each other wrong. I mean, there's a lot of that inherently within our communities. And there's a, a bunch of envy and jealousy and those type of things that are what? Not of God's spirit, right? So we got to recognize we're not, we're defenseless without love. We are defenseless without love. We are defenseless without love. God said the first two commandments was first, number one, love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And then what? Love man, meaning your neighbor. Love man, love his creation. Here's what we need to be hating on, sin. Not the person, hate the sin. I have a problem with the sinful behavior. I don't have a problem with the person. I have a problem with the sin that the person is operating in because I know the penalty that comes behind that. The wages of sin are what? Death. And so no one wants anybody to die. I love because God's love is in me. And that's what compels me to do what I'm doing tonight because I love people. I love myself, but more importantly, I love God first. And so I'm doing what he has commanded me to do. Period. Period. And so you have to have the right attitude relative to your position in Christ Jesus because it says right here, it has to be love. Go to Galatians 5 and 6. I'll prove it to you. Galatians 5 and 6 says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. And that's the religious thing, right? In the religion, the Jews talked about being uncircumcised, and that's literal. And uncircumcised is spiritual as well, uncircumcised. That's a religious thing. He said, that ain't got anything, religion ain't got nothing to do with this, he's saying. Religion ain't got nothing to do with this, right? Period. Please realize that. He says, it counts for, it doesn't count for anything. But watch this. But only. Faith working through love. So the only time your religion or your acts in life of faith mean anything if love is a part of it. If you're doing it in love and not for gain. Not for monetary gain. Not for idolatry to be idolized. See, a lot of people use religion to be, idol uh, to be idolized, to profit, to take advantage of God's sheep. Okay? But if it's done out of love, then you're operating in saving faith. You're operating in saving faith. It's so apparent now. It has to be clear because these are the end of days. We have to know who are we following, who are we listen to, what am I reading, what am I receiving, who am I in Christ, whose am I. 
Am I locked in? Do I know who I am? Do I have the right identity? Do I know that my salvation is secure? You got to know based on what I'm sharing with you tonight. This is what's to get us ready for the harvest that's going to come to win more souls into the kingdom of God. We've got to get right Lake Wynn in preparation for that. All right, moving forward. So if you have no love for God or receive the gospel, which proclaims God's love towards you, or you don't love man who's God's creation, you need to question your saving faith. You need to question your faith. If you got hateration in your heart for man, you can't stand nobody. You're always arguing and fighting and fussing and cussing and acting a fool towards man ready to kill, strike, maim, stab, shoot. You got some issues because you're murdering, killing. You in this like I'm ready to fight every five minutes. You're always in a fight. You got issues. I don't like man. I don't like white man, black man, Chinese man. I got issues with mankind. I just got issues and I can't deal with it. I'm, I just hate people. People hate us. Then I question the love of God in your life. Right? I question. I just question it. Not to say that you won't get saved at some point in time or that you won't be able to operate and obtain salvation at some point in time. But if you are now claiming to be born again, but yet you're hating on people and you're operating and, you, and you're happy to hate on folks and, and, and you hate the word of God, you don't even want to hear it. You can't even listen to it and sit still for a minute and allow the word of God to minister to you. You need to check your faith. You need to check your faith. Don't want to go to church. I don't like them church people. I don't like the church. We're supposed to love the church. Even in its issues, we need to love the church. That's the body of Christ. We got to love on each other because if we don't have love in the church, how in the world are we going to get folks to come to the love of God because we're representatives of God? We got to have that love, y'all. You got to have it. If you don't have it, then that means God is not in you because what? God is love, according to the scriptures. So if you got God, you got love, baby. If you got Jesus, you abide in Jesus and Jesus abiding in God, then you abide in love. And then your faith is working like it should. Holy Spirit's got you. You're rolling. Love moves and operates in gasoline for faith to do what it does from a biblical saving faith standpoint. It's that love. God so loved the world. Come on now. So if he loved it, we got to love it too. And we got to love the Jesus Christ answer antidote to the virus of sin. We got to get this thing out there to folks and start saving folks because the end is near. And it's okay because you know why? We're good on the other side of the end. The God has a plan for us. He says, keep our eyes on that. Keep your mind on eternity. Don't get stuck in the world, getting stuck about all the good and the, the fancy cars and the money and all. That's great, grand and wonderful, but don't get locked into it. Don't worship that stuff. You need to be concerned about what comes after because everybody's going to die. And you can't take it with you. Amen. Amen. All right. Moving on. How do we do this? Watch this. But if we are, uh, excuse me, but we must also acknowledge faith alone saves. Not the fruit of faith or our good works in faith. As Paul writes, go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I'm going to prove it to you. So you won't think I'm being her heretical. I'm not a heretic. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says this. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved. What? Through faith. You see that? For by grace, a gift. You have been saved through faith, believing in Jesus Christ. That's what saved you. Watch this. Mm. And this is not your own doing. Then who's doing it? In other words, you're not going to be saved in your own doing. You think you can do something to get God to accept you? No, all he's asking you to do is accept what? Jesus Christ in faith. Believe that Jesus died for you. You don't have to die again to get born again. You die to self selfishness, but you live unto Christ. Come on now. And his mission and his purpose and his plan and what he did. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Not about us, but it's about Jesus. Come on now. Watch this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Amen. Not a result of your works. Come on. So that no one may boast. So no one can brag about the fact, oh, I got saved. I did it myself. I was the man. I got, no, 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 no. I'm saved because I received Jesus Christ and now I'm experiencing the results of making that quality decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and the Messiah. Come on now. So how do we relate Paul's two different ideas, namely the faith that faith works by love, but that we are saved by faith apart from works? Watch this. Go to Romans 3, 28, and then we'll look at Romans 4 and 6. 
Romans 3 and 28 says this, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So one is justified by faith, not by doing the law. You know, God, I did right. I, I didn't covet. Lord, I didn't steal. I didn't lie. You know, all the commandments. So I'm saved because I, I adhere to the law. No, you done broke one of them laws. And when you break one, the Bible says you done broke all of them. So if, if, without Jesus, you can't commit and make all them laws work for you to be then accepted by God into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was perfect. He kept all the laws. Amen. That's why you have to have faith and belief in Jesus who was able in his perfection in human flesh to commit and make sure he kept all the laws that God had laid. Jesus is the only one who did it. That's why you accept him. Lord have mercy. Y'all getting this. Y'all getting this. Go to Romans 4 and 6. Watch what David did. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one who is Jesus, the Messiah, to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. So even David, in the prophetic word in the Old Testament, knows that Jesus, who was going to be the Messiah, was going to be the righteous one. He knew he wasn't the righteous one. He said, no. That's why they called Jesus the son of David. David already knew there was going to be one. God had told him he had known. That's the one. That's the one. Not the 10 million of people who think they're working themselves in. No, only one. Those 10 million have to come through the one. I'm giving you the example. It's the one, Jesus Christ that we must be akin to. We must be locked in, convicted, trust in what he did is valid, and we good to go. Saving faith. Righteousness, come on, Pastor Riley's preaching on it. You need to understand this. There's only one right one. That was Jesus. He's the righteousness of God. So if we receive him, then guess what? We receive the righteousness of God when we receive Jesus Christ, which then allows us to participate in a righteous type of position relative to our relationship with God because we accepted and believed in and received Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It's right there in the scriptures. Now, moving forward, when the apostle Paul expounded the doctrine of justification, how sinners can receive the forgiveness of their sins and the right and title to eternal life, he returned to the earliest pages of scripture and the life of Abraham. If you go to Romans 4 and 23, he said, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Romans 4, 2 and 3 says this, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Boom. Believing in God's plan for Jesus is what accounted Abraham to be righteous, not the works. Not doing stuff to try to be perfect and follow the laws that were laid out in the land at that time. You can, you can forget it. You won't be able to do it because you're in sin. You have sinful flesh and it's going to miss it every single time. But once you make the decision to believe, then that accounts towards your righteousness. Praise God. Abraham looked to the promised Messiah, saw his day from afar, and trusted in God's promise. Go to Galatians 3, 10 and 14. The righteousness shall live, or the righteous shall live by faith. Watch this. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. So those who think that their good acts and their good feelings and they're being nice to people and they're being perfect and doing, I don't steal, I don't lie, I don't commit adultery, you know. So, uh, but you don't have Jesus, you're cursed. Cursed meaning you're going to suffer from the penalty of the sin that's still on you. You haven't been redeemed for sin. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Go to verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, not by keeping the law. Verse 12 says, but the law is not of faith. It's just to bring sinners to an understanding that you ain't right. Just like the laws of the land out here. You break the law. The law is there to make sure you understand you broke it. <laughs> Run a red light. You just broke the law. That doesn't make you perfect. That ain't going to make you not guilty when you get to court. You broke the law, right? The law is there to let you know you're out of bounds. But that doesn't get you saved. Ooh -wee. Says, verse 12, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law 
by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The promised spirit through faith. So by believing in the gospel that Jesus Christ loves us and died for us and he suffered for us and he took on the curse from us, then by doing that, God then in change, God, Jesus said, I will now leave you with the comforter. Now you have the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit becomes our helper on our journey in our new life as a Christian to not fall prey and remain in darkness. To be able to get back up when we fall and keep it moving forward. You see how that works? He's our helper when we have no more strength. When we're struggling in our sickness, when we're struggling in our marriages, when we're struggling with our children and keeping them in line, when we're struggling in our finances, when we're struggling in our minds and we have mental issues and we're struggling, we're struggling. Holy Spirit is there to what? Help us to have victory, to overcome those things. We are now what? More than overcomers in Jesus Christ. Come on, y'all. Because of the spirit of God that's in us now as born again believers. Amen. One last scripture. Woo. And even though faith works through love, Galatians 5 and 6, we've talked about God, God does not factor this love in the justification of sinners as Paul makes abundantly clear. Romans 4, 4 and 5 says this. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Wow. Stop trying to earn your way in the blessings and the favor of God. Just receive Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how we're going to end that. Salvation is the key. That's why I wanted to make sure we translated and, and talked about saving faith. So when we get to this moment, every Wednesday night, you know we're not just doing it out of a routine, but there's a special opportunity for someone to be born again. And so we talk about Romans 10 and 9, and God laid out very specifically what's the process, the process by which you make yourself available for this wonderful gospel to be manifested in your life. And it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, period. But it goes on to say in verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. There it is. Not work, not your works, not what you're doing. Just believe in this gospel. Believe in God's word. Believe in our Jesus and that's when righteousness becomes available to us. We are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, through faith in Jesus. Amen. Woo. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Tithes and offerings are very important, a part of our, our biblical faith. Giving is a given. God is about a giving human being. Be a cheerful giver. All of the things that you've given to our ministry, whether it be in deed and your actions in terms of serving, awesome. Thank you so much because serving is a sacrifice and it is a giving type of moment and method or and that's acceptable unto the Lord as long as it's being done unto the Lord and in Christ by faith. That's when it's, a, it's counted as value. Your value in your seed and giving your seed into the ministry so we have the ability to keep the doors open so that when the harvest comes we can serve them in excellence with the lights on and heat in the winter and air in, 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 the, uh, in the summer and so forth and so on and, and make sure that it's excellent a beautiful building we want to make sure the temple is beautiful and clean and safe and, and, and not have all of these different things being spread in terms of viruses and so forth. We do that in our ministry. We want you all to come. So thank you. Give through Givelify. That's how we give. Praise God. And then lastly, uh, brothers and sisters, we're talking about next week's services. Obviously, this Sunday we're having service. Please come join us. Uh, we love to praise. We love to hear the word from God. We love to be in fellowship with one another. It's wonderful. We have some wonderful things going on. Our ministry is now growing. I've seen growth again. Praise God. We want to keep on growing. We got new members. We got, man, it's exciting to see new faces. Folks are coming. God is calling his people and we want to be there front line to receive them and usher them into the kingdom. Praise God. With the blessing that God has given us by being born again and being a part of the leadership in the kingdom. Praise God. 
Also, closing out YouTube, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Thank you for viewing through YouTube. Praise God. And then also, we really support your Facebook uh, followers. Thank you so much. God bless you all. May God forever be a blessing in your life. And then also, may you be a blessing to others. Love God and love your fellow man. Y'all have a good night, and I'll see you this weekend, Sunday. Bye-bye.